begin our session. I'm uh, Prof. Farida from the International Islamic University. Uh, my office hosts this uh, e-forum, but I would like to introduce the moderator, um, Mr. Yusaini, who will then take over and introduce our esteemed three panelists. Yeah, let me introduce you, Muhammad Yusaini bin Muhammad Yusuf. He's the president of Malaysia Peaceful Environment Association. He studied gastronomy at University Technology Mara, and this could have shaped his worldview towards environment and nature. He founded Grass Malaysia with a small group of activists who believe that Islam could solve the yeah, environmental crisis. Grass Malaysia also explores the golden age of the Malay Empire that had offered its own technology and uh, practice towards preserving nature and environment. Yusaini is also involved in many consultant works with government agencies, NGOs, both here and abroad. And recently, he's, in, uh, he's involved in all political party group Malaysia, which is set up by Parliament of Malaysia for the uh, Sustainable Development Agenda. Grass Malaysia also represents Playground Ideas International. They are also involved in Green Muslim Connective, the ICE Network, which is like Inter-Religious Climate and Econom Ecology Network. Global Muslim Climate Network, International Alliance for Localization. So please welcome Isaimi, who will then take over the forum. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Thank you, Prof. Farida, for introduction. But <clears throat> Alhamdulillah, we have a uh, shukur today because we, we meet a great people in this line. Uh, basically, I'm just a foot soldier. Uh, so uh, <laughs> just uh, six years on environment issue. Uh, before that, mostly in other use. Uh, agenda. But let me introduce our speaker for this morning. Uh, first is our host, uh, Dr. Zulkifli Abdul Razak, Professor Emeritus, uh, Tan Sri Dato. Uh, short is uh, Dr. Zul, currently director for International uh, IIUM, International Islamic University of Malaysia. Uh, previously is a vice chancellor for USM, University Science of Malaysia, uh, immediate president for, past president for International Association University uh, UNESCO affiliate, uh, then also Governor Regional Center for Expertise of Education Sustainable Development based on USM, USM sorry, and award also uh, received also prestigious uh, Gilbert Medal in 2007 by Universitas 31, recognition of long-term commitment for sustainable approach to international higher education. And also, she, uh, he also involved with a fellow Academy of Science from Malaysia, World Academy of Art and Science, and World Academy of Islamic Management. Uh, okay, uh, too long to introduce is too long. You can write, uh, find out in the detail on the Dr. Professor Tan, Tan Sri Datuk Zulkifli Abdul Razak. He's a well-known academician in Malaysia. Uh, it's a long, very long commitment with education. Uh, second, we also have uh, Dr. Mary Evelyn Tucker, uh, 20 years in uh, eco religious agenda, uh, graduate, uh, portrait in, I think, in Buddhist. China in Japan, I am mistaken. Okay, <clears throat> now it's currently uh, co-founder and director of Forum and Religious Ecology at Yale University. Uh, joined uh, master program, teach also in uh, master program in religion and ecology in Yale between School of Forest Environment Study and the Divinity School. Uh, have uh, have around what twenty volume of a. Uh, Author and uh, co-author public publication. Uh, also, she very active. This is my favorite Green Belt Movement, the late Warani Matai. Uh, I also refer to Warani Matai works. Uh, and the best part, uh, uh, Dr. Taka also involved with a movie you call it Jenny, Jenny, yeah, Jenny. We shall also uh, receive the best documentary at North California Emmy Award. Okay, actually, I'm going to suggest Prof. Rida we show the movie. Okay, <laughs> maybe again. Okay? Uh, Dr. Taka also received a Lifetime Achievement Award in uh, Religion and Ecology. Okay, uh, another lot of award. Uh, okay, next will be Dr. Fakuridin uh, 
menjeri Mangkun Jaya. I follow personally Dr. Fakhridaya most almost five years uh, since the talk of Green Hajj in Tabung Haji. If you remember, Dr. Uh, Dr. Fakhridaya Mangkun Jaya is very quite active now currently in a cent, uh, Center for Center for Islamic Study, Vice Director for Conservation of Environment and Natural Resources uh, under Majlis Ulama Indonesia, fellow the climate leader. Okay. Uh, he also active in United Nations level and uh, local uh, in Indonesia. Lot of uh, publication also. Uh, I'll, I'll both uh, three of you, I will buy your right book don't worry <laughs> okay uh, we start going to start because uh, we have a limit of time and a time constraint also we we'll... <clears throat> okay currently we have a uh, in the, in modern world we have a uh, we call it success uh, the progress of development but it's quite hollow so no point we have a success uh, nation but we don't we have a what we call it uh, no soul success we have no soul so today we're going to discuss how religion is going to affect and help us on the current issue of environment. Because no point we're having a lot of a new building, largest building, tallest building, end of the day, at the expense of our environment. We're losing a lot of our beauty, uh, fish, river, and also a lot of our uh, animal that we lost already. Okay? Uh, so the first question for... We give uh, the first round. We give to the Professor Tan Sri Doctor for your morning talk today. Please welcome. <laughs> okay, uh, is I'm on. Is it, um... yeah. Yeah, 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 please. Okay. So, okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Uh, greeting of peace. Good morning. Uh, nice to meet all of you, particularly Mary, all the way uh, uh, in US. Uh, what I will try to do today was basically to give my own interpretation of what this topic is all about uh, just to qualify just to qualify that i'm not a religious person <laughs> i have, no, I have no, no training in in religious studies per se but i do get involved in sustainable development and being a muslim i try to kind of uh, you know reconcile uh, what both is all about so this is my presentation maybe for uh, 20 minutes half an hour uh, I would like to uh, rephrase a little bit the, the title. When we talk about religion, I want to talk it in the context of a way of life uh, rather than a ritualistic sort of practice. And when we talk about environmentalism, I don't think there is an ism in, in Islam as far as environmental is concerned. But yet environment is one of the missions of life as far as Muslim is concerned. How do you protect it? How do you promote it? And how do you live integratively with that? Yeah. Uh, the last, the bottom of the slides uh, show where we are, and we have just been, quote unquote, uh, acknowledged by United Nations University as a regional center of expertise for sustainable development, meaning to say that we will focus on certain aspects of sustainable development, and particularly in the context of spirituality and sustainability. This has been uh, our forte, and this is part and parcel of the presentation that I want, I want to, to, to share with you uh, today. Now, uh, going on that basis, uh, let me see. All right. So when, when you talk about religion as a way of life, as far as Muslim is concerned, as far as Islam is concerned, there are four relationships that you want to look at. Uh, one relationship is certainly uh, us and God. In other words, human being and the divine. What is the relationship like? Uh, arising from that, then we need to talk about the human being and himself, me and myself. I think this is another another dimension that is often not uh, uh, brought to fore. How do we live with ourselves before we talk about living with other people? So in other words, how do we uh, reconcile within ourselves before we project it to other people, humanity at large? And finally, I think, how do you go about to interact with the whole environment? And this is where the topic today is about human and nature as such. So I'll try to dwell very briefly on these four dimensions and focus on the human and the, and the environment or nature part of it as we go along. Now, if you talk about 
the first dimension, uh, the, and this must be in a state of balance. All this must exist. So it's difficult to talk about just human and the environment without reflecting God, without reflecting yourself, and without reflecting on your human being. You cannot take it out and just speak about environment without balancing with the three things. I think that is the kind of uh, uh, philosophy, if you want. Uh, how do you actually work with the environment and work with the other dimensions at the same time, right? So let's see how, how, do you, how do you work on this. So if you talk about the human dimension and the divine, certainly I think as far as Islam is concerned, there are a number of issues that we believe. One is the context of balance, the context of mizan. When we talk about life per se, environment or otherwise, it has to be a balanced life. Right. Some people who want to call it moderation, wasatiyah, depending on who you speak to. And that must be an orderly, an orderly fashion, systematic fashion that will keep the balance afloat. Once you lose the balance, then you lose the whole thing and the whole thing becomes quote, quote unquote chaotic, is no longer peaceful. So this three dimension, I think, is an important dimension to keep in mind as we go along for the discussion, and that will then create a different dimension at the same time. For, for To maintain this, there is what we call in Islam, amana. I'm sure you have heard of this. Uh, the trust, we are trustees of whatever God created, and, and we need to look after it and promote it. Yeah? In other words, our role, not only as leader, but as stewardship at the same time keeping the kind of a sacred covenant, this kind of sacred agreement, a promise that we made with the uh, divine, and also keeping it intact as a point of a kind of a divine inspired mission. So that will be the kind of basis that we need to uh, look into. And from then, I think we will talk about the second dimension. Once you have that, then how do you then put it within yourself? Knowing that human beings are basically spiritual beings first, before the human being dimension. So we need to add down there what we call the human scale. Although we talk on the perspective of divine, the human scale becomes important, meaning to say, how do we interact with the environment, given our physical dimension, given our own capacity, our own limitation, and also the sensory capacity that we've got. These are the issues, I think, that eventually takes us to the environment. But before that, like I say, we need to understand who we are, and this is a dimension that I need to look into within us. I think in most discussion, I think it has been missed out because we just go on the exterior, the external, the extrinsic without introspecting who we are. And this is where the issue of spirituality, the balance between spiritual, the balance between physical, the balance between external and internal, extrinsic, intrinsic, all things must come into play so that we create an, a, a moderation, a pathway which is middle path. So we don't divert, in other words, we don't... So when we talk about extremism in Islam, to me, it is not Islamic anymore. You have to stay on the path of moderation, and that path, I think, is an act of balancing. It becomes, in, in many respects, also a kind of a moral compass of what is right and what is wrong, given the divine inspiration uh, that I talked to you about. And these are what the limits are. You know, you cannot, ex you cannot transgress those limits. If you transgress those limits, then you go into a, a chaotic uh, or, or a, you, you destroy and the peace or the balance with it. Yeah? Despite, despite that, I think there is a kind of an ascending movement. In other words, Muslims are not being Muslims, are becoming. Everyday Muslims try to aspire something higher. And that is the, the, that is the kind of a, a journey that we take. It, we are not static, so if we look at the environment, the environment also must flourish at the same time. And this is what the, the, this university is all about. How did the environment flourish as the university flourishes? More often than not, we see as the university flourishes, the, the, the environments get degraded. So how do you avoid this? To have into this ascending sort of spirit? Because this is a microcosmos that we need to create within ourselves. In other words, we need to understand ourselves as a balanced human person, and how do you take this journey upwards? And that will be the trajectory that we will then push outside when we talk about the environment per se on, on, on the external part. Yeah? So there is, I just want to quote uh, this hadith, Allah does not see your outward appearances or possession, but sees within your heart and your deeds. In other words, what is important is how do we start inside before we project it outside. So to be human being 
in a spiritual dimension, I think it's the first step before we even engage the world outside of humanity or environment outside. I think this is my 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 my, my take off point uh, as you as you move into the other argument of how do you then talk about or balance yourself with humanity per se. Yeah. So we have this dimension now as far as being orderly, being balanced, being peaceful, having that other dimension of being spiritual, moderate, and, and, and more moral at the same time. But this, like I say, it has to be an evolving sort of a, a trajectory, moving from inside out. So in other words, a person who has not experienced balance, a person who has not experienced peace, a person who has not experienced moderation, will have find hard time to work with other people outside them because they don't know what this means in trying to you know, uh, engage humanity or other uh, community or other nationalities or other religion at the same time. So this will be the kind of uh, trajectory, I think at the end of the day that we want to talk about. And finally, I think we then talk about the whole dimension that God talks about there is no difference between one group, one tribe, or one nation. I think there is one of the surah that talks about all oh, human being. I think the conventional one will talk about all oh, mankind, all oh, humankind. But I think all oh, human being, man, female, uh, male, female. We created you from a female, uh, from a male and a female, and made you into nation and tribes so that you may know one another. I think this is a very important sort of uh, principle. That whatever we talked about in terms of uh, environment or uh, whatever else, as far as Islam is concerned, how do you keep unity as one of the biggest mission as far as creation is concerned? So it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, uh, what you are. Uh, I, I, I think this is a message that needs to be thought about. I think it's important to realize this now as we go into this COVID uh, 19, the kind of disparity we see, the kind of protest we see, you know, all, all those things. Uh, to me, it's bring back this whole nation. Are we one in trying to save the world, in trying to save humanity, uh, given this threat of COVID-19? Without which, I think we will be divided again in so many dimensions. Yeah? So that is the background. And now let's move into from the microcosm to the macrocosm. The same, the same issue of being balanced, being orderly, and being peaceful, but on a greater dimension of what I call the macrocosmos. So in other words, within us, the microcosmos, we have experienced it, we know what it is, and then how do you project it on the world stage, as it were, not only ourselves and the humanity, but also all forms of life. The animals, the birds, uh, the trees, uh, the solar system, all these are part and parcel of the microcosmos as God has created that must remain in the balanced, orderly, and peaceful state. I think this is the issue that I think this becomes uh, very critical in trying to understand the total dimension between human being and, and its nature. So taking that from a different point of view, when we talk about in modern jargons today, we talk about being equitable. Is the environment equitable? Is the is a society equitable? Indeed, is the world equitable? That will be the, 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 the fundamental of how we see Islam and the environment. Yeah? And it's also, is it harmonious? It could be equitable, but is it harmonious? Does it maintain the balance that we talked about? In, 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 in the creation of God. And last but not least is the whole question of being sustainable. It is a sustainable sort of a, a outcome at the end of the day when we understand this. And in the context of nature, then are we sharing the things that we've got? So in other words, an environment, is the environment being shared? Did everybody prosper from the environment or, or just one side prospering the environment? I think basically this is what the moderator was trying to say. You know, we have built buildings and we have got very nice facilities, but is it shared throughout? Or is it mean for just certain people, certain group of people, certain nationalities? These are issues that I think that needs to be talked about. In other words, are we inclusive? The word inclusiveness, as I mentioned in, in, in the surah just now, how can we unify and get everybody to share and also experience the same thing that all human beings are entitled? 
So the whole process is a natural process, it's an organic process. It isn't, it's not a process that, uh, that is man-made. It has all sorts of barriers. How do you make it into an organic thing? And this is where I think the understanding of internal becomes important because it's part and parcel of the primordial sort of intelligence within you. And it has to be a human skill. Human skill in the sense that we can relate to it, we can uh, you know, uh, work with it, uh, not something that is beyond us. I think tendency now today, especially when you talk about technology, sometimes we do not understand what this technology is all about. And we become, quote unquote, the slaves of technology rather than you know, living with technology or working through technology. I think this is an important uh, dimension. And at the end of the day, when we talk about this, we talk about then all life matters. I think it's not just the blacks or the whites or the brown, but all life matters, including those of the animals. We are now talking about maybe 2,000, about 200 uh, species extinct uh, every day. We are going into the six mass uh, extinction already. Yeah, We are talking about the Anthropocene era. All this threatens life. And in other words, as far as Islam is concerned, this is not acceptable. How do you reverse it? How do you make it happen? the way it was before, so that we observe all these fundamentals of being balanced, orderly, and so on and so forth, as part and parcel of the interaction between men, Muslims in particular, and nature around them, so that it could be preserved as a kind of an amana or the trust, uh, the stewardship that I talked to you earlier. Yeah? So in summary, some of the case that I probably want to show, there's another, another, uh, another, uh, Ayat from the Quran that talks, destruction has spread on land and sea. I want to use this case of the, the Aral Sea that is dried up, I think, uh, early this year. And that just, there's a picture, there's a boat, you know, uh, being stranded, and the, the sea has, been, has receded. And this is what the Quran said, destruction has spread on land and sea this is probably a case in point. And it says here, as a result of the people's hand have done. And in this case, it is about trying to create uh, the cotton industry, using irrigation, uh, creating you know, all sorts of other economic, modern economic being. But at the end of the day, it has destroyed the environment. And the ayat later said this, so that God may cause them to taste the consequence of their deeds. And what is the consequence of their deeds in this case? So many millions of factors of land are now being degraded because of poor uh, management of water and poor management of uh, the crops itself. Yeah? And I think this way, when we talk about climate change, from my point of view, this is the kind of realization that we need to have. We have done something wrong, and we need to put it back in the proper balanced, orderly manner that I talked to you about. And hopefully, uh, these, are, these are some of the other consequences. Yeah? As far as RLC is concerned, it's polluted with herbicide, metal, salts, and so on and so forth. In other words, the whole uh, ecosystem has been destroyed from sea to land and the land which is toxic and poisonous uh, at the moment in time. So that at the end of the day, we will realize, and it says here, and perhaps they might return to the right path. So going back to the whole idea of the way of life, we have now probably lost the way of life, the moderation that we talked about. And how do you bring this back is the issue of what is the role of religion as a way of life in trying to, you know, uh, bring back uh, what is rightly the, the, what the, the divine inspired sort of messages, right? So I would like to summarize. These are the four elements that we talk about, human and divine, human and then himself, and human, uh, between human and human interaction, and human and nature, right? So we need to now take the, the what you call uh, the lessons uh, from the divine inspiration and make this four relationship work. In other words, learning from what is inspired to us, right? Balance what is the microcosm. We need to train ourselves first before we even talk about the environment. If we do not understand who we are and the purpose of living, then I think to tackle the environment becomes an arduous task because we don't know where we are heading and for what purpose we are doing certain things. So deriving from that, we begin to train ourselves, and this is where the spirituality, uh, being a Muslim, uh, and the values that is embedded to it becomes important. Then we will then project it to humanity as a whole, taking into nature as part of the bigger microcosm, 
right? And asking the question then, what is the purpose of life? I think we, we need to end up with that, understanding the purpose of life. Once you understand the purpose of life, you probably understand the meaning of life, and then we can begin to take our journey moving forward, yeah? with the dimension inside us as a kind of a compass that takes you uh, to where we should be on, in the context of the divine revelation and the divine inspiration. So I think I will stop there. I want just to summarize, in other words, by saying before we talk about ecology, we need to understand all the other dimension that supports the ecology and the environment. And to us, it's not an ism. It's not a theory, it's not a, it's not a hypothesis, it is part and parcel of the human life, but it has to be integrated. The moment you take it out, like fish out of water, then you find that you will not be able to handle it, because the ecological system itself is already not what it was, not what it is in the context of the divine revelation or the divine inspiration. So on that note, I want to relate this very quickly to this whole idea of sustainable development. We are beginning here now to understand where sustainable development is all about when we talk about all these dimension that I've mentioned to you. So sustainable development is not just another dimension uh, from the United Nations or the UNESCO sort of a, 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 what they call the idea of uh, the Brantland Report, but how do you integrate religion at the same time? I think we've just finished a book on spirituality and sustainable development envisaging there'll be another sustainable development goal which we talk about spirituality there is sustainable development goal 18. we have written a book on it and we hope we will have more discussion on how we put this as a kind of a cross-cutting measures in trying to bring uh, religion not only islam i think all religions in this particular context uh, as part and parcel of protecting life protecting the environment and certainly protecting humanity as such so thank you very much for that. If there's any question, we probably can discuss it uh, later. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. <coughs> so to be fair, it's not uh, 20 minutes uh, to summarize our 25 years of experience, but I just uh, put there is a uh, Prof talking about here, uh, and the suggestion is nature. Okay, I will note on that. Uh, I'd like to invite a second speaker for this morning is a uh, Dr. Tucker. Yes. Please. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be with you. And I look forward to learning as I have just now from the rector's marvelous discussion. Uh, I really love the notion of religion as a way of life. And I'll come to that later in my discussion. But I'm also very much enamored of the ideas that he mentioned, the balance, the mise-en, of course, the sense of order, uh, the ta'weed, uh, the sense of trusteeship, uh, which is such a beautiful idea, Khalifa. I think trusteeship is one of the richest ideas in the world's religions for how we can care for nature. And his call to the sacred, um, to a spiritual dimension is absolutely essential to everything that we're talking about here. So I thank the rector uh, for those wonderful comments and I especially love the microcosm, macrocosm dimensions uh, because I study in particular Confucianism uh, which goes across the regions that many of you live in and that of course has a very strong dimension also of microcosm, macrocosm. So I should begin officially with saying salam alaikum and bringing yeah. peace from our hearts to heart and especially um, from our land, which is very troubled, as you know. And so I want to actually begin with a little bit of my own story, if that's all right, to say how I came into the, these studies of religion and ecology. And it has something to do with where we are now, even as a globe. I went to college in Washington, D.C., and in large part to be involved in the civil rights movement for racial justice uh, that we're still working out in our country. And I was involved in demonstrations and protests in the 60s, especially in 68 through 71. 
I was also involved in the anti-Vietnam War movement, seeking deep peace, uh, which we are still searching for. And the explosion of militarism around the world, uh, often led by our own country here, is something uh, I'm very sorry for. So I come with a sense of humility. I come with a sense of apology. I come with a deep, deep sense of wanting to be a bridge, a balance myself um, to other parts of the world and other cultures. Um, so justice and peace were very important in my youth and I'm sure in your own. And ecology, as you know, 50 years ago, the first Earth Day developed. And in Washington, there was huge uh, celebrations, actually, um, and millions of people participated. So this sense of justice, peace, and ecology is something that needs to be even more deeply integrated. It's what we tried to do in the Earth Charter, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. That took 10 years to articulate something that said the integrity, uh, ecological integrity is primary, the integrity of creation. Um, social and economic justice has to be in relation to nature and nature system. And finally, democracy, nonviolence, and peace. Those are the three pillars of the Earth Charter. And I think it's part of this movement that we're all working uh, together on. So again, I, I welcome and learn from these conversations. You know, Islam is a tradition, well over a billion people in all parts of the world. In 1973, I, Ford, 1974, my first trip was to a Muslim country, Indonesia. I studied um, and taught in Japan in 1973 and 74. And then I traveled all through Asia. It was a time when you could do that easily and rather cheaply, as you know. And I began to absorb something of the fascination with these religions, these cultures, these worldviews, Borbador and uh, these magnificent monuments and so on. Um, I was in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur uh, a little bit later, um, but this notion of what this great tradition, the Islamic tradition can contribute towards ecology, justice and peace is I think uh, absolutely central and on the forefront of many concerns um, of, of all of us that we share. So this, this time, of, of experiencing something, of course, very small, uh, but nonetheless impactful of seeing the world's religions and the uh, expressions of them as way of life, um, began my venture into the study of them. And when I came back, I met an extraordinary person, Thomas Berry, and studied with him at Fordham University and then um, at Columbia University where the program on world religions um, still remains one of the best in the world. So I want to give tribute and thanks to my teachers um, who helped John Grimm, my husband and I, move into this area. Now, um, why? You know, I think there's a sense that scientists have led the movement on the environment. Policy people and lawyers have so much to contribute economists now and green economy and certainly alternative technologies. All of these are necessary, but not sufficient to where we need to go. And when Gus Beth, who was the head of the United Nations Development Program and uh, also founded World Resources Institute, he brought John and me to Yale in, 19, in, in 2006 because he said, we have the science and policy and so on, but we don't have a moral force for change. We need the religions. We also need the culture and the arts that they represent. So that was a major shift. But let me back up and say um, how that missing link uh, began to emerge. You know, it was very difficult when we began this series of conferences at Harvard in 1995 to 1998. And the Islam and Ecology Conference was in 1998, 
uh, in May, 22 years ago. Um, this is the book that, that came out of it with oh. articles from Muslims from all of them. Yeah, Aziz and Barudin, one of the writers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You will know many of the writers, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, Azizan Baharuddin was one yeah. of the editors and yeah. so on. Yes, exactly. So we're grateful for that. And um, as well, we had people from Pakistan, Noman Haq and Fazun Khalid, uh, who lives in, <clears throat> in the UK, but is Pakistani and from Turkey, Ibrahim Ozdemir, and from Iran, Sayed Hussein Nas, who began this field in many ways. So I want to also give tribute um, to him and many others in the Muslim world who've been thinking about this for some time. So let me say then, what did we do <laughs> against great odds? And then I'll try and point to what are we still trying to do right now. With literally hundreds of scholars and environmentalists, people who understood these traditions um, from the scriptures, from the Quran, from traditions, from the Hadith, and from practices. Um, they be we began in conjunction with these uh, scholars and environmentalists to unpack what all the world's religions were saying. So it was beginning to um, till the soil and, and then plant the seeds. Um, this was the first conference, uh, in, international conference, really, on Islam and ecology, and then Christianity and ecology, all the Western religions and so on, but the Asian religions and indigenous traditions. These were dynamic, exciting, um, inspiring moments uh, because everyone said yes, they wanted to come. No one was paid even a stipend, just their plane fare or whatever. So there's this generosity of spirit that was quite astonishing and very impressive. These took place at the Center for the Study of World Religions at yeah. Harvard. That was a very hard place to do it because Harvard is very much in a strict academic vein and Yale is too in its own way. But we're trying to break open the heart of, of academia to say, again, science, policy, law, necessary but not sufficient. Because religion, as you know, is not well understood in academia and uh, outside of academia. Again, a way of life, not just rituals and, and um, very fossilized practices. So what we tried to do, and it's still emerging, is create a field of study within academia, within seminaries, within secondary schools that could begin to explore what these traditions really offered. But in addition, we were trying to create a force. So the field on the one hand with good scholars and thoughtful faith leaders and so on, and then as well this force um, that people like Rudy have been such a great leader what is religious environmentalism, in other words? And what does this mean in, in Indonesia, for example, for the persantrans or for a fatwa uh, and, and so on? So this field and force, if you want, theory and practice coming together for transformative change, that was the, that was the idea. Um, so we have a very large website. I hope it will be useful to you. We've just relaunched it. After a year, it was almost 20 years old and needed updating in all kinds of ways. But we have their, we we'll call it research, education, and outreach. So there's books, the annotation of all these books and so on and articles it's just exploded in 20 years. And um, education, what's happening in colleges and universities and seminaries and so on. And then outreach. We have listed engaged projects from all over the world. What's actually happening for river cleanup or for fisheries uh, and so on, or for agricultural projects. And again, we hope that we can elevate projects from around the Muslim world, for example. Um, and we've made a new partnership with the United Nations Environment Program that launched a Faith for Earth about two years ago, um, led by a Jordanian, um, UN figure, his name is uh, Iyad Abu Mogali, and I must say many Muslims are really gaining wonderful traction and leadership in the United Nations and elsewhere. The head of Religions for Peace, Asa Karam, is from Egypt and so on. So this is marvelous to see leadership 
being dispersed and, and brought into the next generation, new ideas and a variety of religious uh, perspectives and geographical perspectives. So I want to just pause here perhaps and maybe just two other comments that, that I'd love to offer. One is if we take religion as a way of life, if we take religion as not just the texts and even their interpretations, hadith and so on, or the teachings of it uh, and the, the practices in, in rigid ways or in fossilized ways or in ancient ways. But what we like to say is all of these traditions have changed over time. So we like to retrieve from these texts and traditions, reevaluate them in present circumstances and help reconstruct a eco-theology, an eco-religious uh, program and thinking for all the world's religions. This needs to happen. It needs to happen with how women are treated around the world. It needs to happen with how people of various ethnic backgrounds are treated and so on. So all of that retrieving and reevaluating and reconstruction. This is what the great traditions have done. Um, with, uh, in Judaism and Christianity, Islam, all of them have changed over time with the help of theologians, ulama and, and rabbis and so on. So that's one thing we have to help the outside world understand. These are not fossilized traditions. They are changing, <laughs> tend to be conservative, but they are changing over time. And that's the really positive um, dimension here. So if we take this notion that they change um, over time, and we are trying to think, how is this going to reach the next generation? What's the appeal of these great um, traditions? I happen to come from the Christian tradition, I should say. I come actually from a progressive Catholic social justice tradition, which is why I was so involved in civil rights and, and an uh, anti-war uh, position, a position that welcomes immigrants and tolerance and all of that. So my own background was very much influenced by um, a liberal-minded, open-minded um, Catholic social justice. Now, it's a tradition which has uh, conservatives and liberals like every tradition. But what I want to say is it has given me a grounding in which to navigate life. Again, as the rector was suggesting, how do we take the microcosm of ourself uh, in relation to the macrocosm of the universe? And I should say, this is one of the reasons we did Journey of the Universe, which is a film uh, that did win an Emmy and so on. And I hope at a later date, uh, you might see it and maybe we can have a discussion of that film and so on. Um, but I want to just pause here and say, if religion is more than its theology or even its scriptures or even its interpretations, let's open it up so that younger people, the modern world can see its importance and its influence. And here's what we did in a book, a little book called Ecology and Religion. Um, that John and I wrote. I'll be happy to send you a PDF file of it. And we, when we were writing it, we were teaching at Princeton and the undergrads at Princeton were remarkable when we got to this section where we had four notions of here's how religion works. Here's how religion can be inspiring. And the four dimensions are this, that religion helps people to orient themselves to the cosmos, to the, to the whole of this natural world, but also the, the heavens above, if you will, the cosmos, the universe. So there's a sense of orienting us in the grandeur and beauty and awe and complexity of the universe that's brought forth the solar systems and the earth and lots of differentiated life, including human life, and the animals, as the rector pointed to as well. What an extraordinary life system we have here. So orienting humans to this sacred universe, really. 
but then grounding them in earth and ecosystems and this huge biodiversity of life. The explosion of biodiversity in the Cambrian period and so on um, is absolutely astonishing. And the more we learn about these life forms, the more we learn about animal intelligence, about bird migrations and so on, about insects and the interactions with flowers, bees and pollination and all of this, it is an amazing world. So the grounding in these systems, and this is where you see ecology and religion can um, give us an even deeper sense of reverence for these systems and why wouldn't we protect them and why, of course, they are revealing the, the order and beauty that the rector was referring to and the balance of the natural world. So we have orientation, orienting to the cosmos, grounding in earth and ecosystems. Then a third way religion helps us um, is nurturing, nurturing obviously our spiritual life you know, we're living in a spiritual desert in the modern world with materialism gone mad, that everything is consumption, that more and more is better and better. And again, I apologize because that's part of the American dream, that if we have more stuff or bigger houses or whatever, that we're going to be happier. And it is such a false dream. And that is what is breaking down right now. So that the true nurturing of the human spirit, which is what keeps us truly living, that's what's breaking through in human consciousness right now with all the suffering, with the pandemic, with people losing jobs and um, just awful, awful suffering. So this sense of nurturing, all the religions bring this in with, with food, uh, with water and wine in, in a Eucharist in a Christian sense, but the nurturing takes elements of nature and makes it sacred, sharing of meals. The huge fast of Ramadan um, helps us to understand when, when we don't have that, how we value food, the way it's grown, uh, the systems that we need for sustainable development that are going to give health to people and the planet. <laughs> we have healthy people on a sick planet. And that's what this pandemic is illustrating over and over again. So nurturing of food and spiritual sustenance is another way that religion supports humans and human and nature. And finally, um, the sense of transformation so the, all of this orienting to the heavens, grounding in the earth, nurturing in food and spiritual sustenance transforms us for the action that has to take place, for the energy that we need not to burn out, not to get discouraged, not to give up, not to be in despair, which I see in many of our young people here at Yale, even at the School of the Environment, they're so worried about the future. So how can we give them not just the scientific knowledge that they need to heal these ecosystems and so on, but also the sustenance for the long-term change that's ahead of us? So. This sense then of these four dimensions of how religion works may help open this up to scientists who don't really understand how religions work, to young people who are trying to find their way, um, to even materialists who uh, find the emptiness of things, to existentialists uh, who are looking for something deeper. So philosophy is looking for, they're calling it vibrant matter the aliveness of matter. Um, this is happening in many, many places. And I think we all who share this concern for religion and the environment can help um, open the doors. So let me finish um, by just touching on, because I suspect Rudy will touch on this as well, two projects that illustrate what is happening right now in religion and the environment. One is the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative that came out of Norway 
Um, the Norwegian government has given millions of dollars for rainforest protection, but in conjunction with the United Nations Environment Program, <coughs> Charles McNeil and his team there have really helped to set up programs in Indonesia, in uh, the Amazon, and in the Congo to preserve rainforests. But how? By highlighting the voices of indigenous traditions and peoples as protectors of the forest, as the cultural um, conveyors of knowledge for millennia of how these incredible ecosystems work. And it's saying we in the other world's religions, be it mu the Muslim tradition or the Christian tradition or Confucian tradition, must support the voices of indigenous peoples. So this is a very, very unique program and I hope Rudy will touch on it. And finally, I think despite all the problems of the Catholic Church, and as I say, I come out of that, so I'm very aware of the problems, but the, this Pope, Pope Francis, his encyclical Laudato Si, Care for Our Common Home, is I think a watershed. It has had enormous effect around the world. Even young people are picking it up. Many environmentalists here in the US are saying it's one of the most important documents of our time. Why? Because it brings together this tremendous sense of, of trusteeship for creation and care for humans and social justice. So it's social justice and the environment coming together in eco-justice. This is a watershed, an absolutely critical moment, um, and the sense of an integral ecology going forward in the encyclical Laudato Si is something I think we can all draw on. So I'll end with those two, I think, very positive examples in, the, in our present period, and I'm delighted to hear from Rudy going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Uh, I can relate to you uh, most of it. Uh, one thing is when I was a student, I'm looking forward for demonstration also. <laughs> That's why I usually call I'm a foot soldier. I prefer outdoor compared to the indoor activities. Uh, okay, uh, basically uh, talking about um, the function of a religious, we can say this religious basically is the houses. So for uh, provide a, a spiritual uh, for people with a thirst of uh, knowledge, all that, and also is a uh, in a present people now we have what we call it a nature deficit okay but the religious provide the solution for it okay thank you for your presentation next i i invited the faculty makunjaya to present this uh, talk today this morning. please okay uh, sound please wait a minute later they don't on your speaker yet. Boleh? Tak mana kita speaker dia? Assalamualaikum. Ada kita ada ni. Eh, mana? Okay. Okay, please sudah. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry with this uh, technology. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Let me Say good morning for all. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Amma ba'du. Um, ladies and gentlemen, all the participant and IU, IIUM Malaysia uh, is glad to to meet with the team all uh, yang berbahagia Datu uh, Zul Razak professor uh, and professor Mary Evelyn Tucker far from the US and all the participants that coming to this um, meeting thank you very much for the opportunity to share i would like to more um practical sharing on what happened in indonesia so i will play with my presentation hopefully i get to share oh, let me share
please tell me if, if it is work. Not yet. It's good. Or no, not yet. Not yet. Sebentar. Yeah. Um, Tadi kita tidak try ya. Harusnya desktop. Oke. Okay. Open system. Okay, general. Uh, what is this? Okay, okay. Is this work? Ada? No, no, no. Okay. Belum aja ya. I send it to to the, the, the committee for backup. Can can someone helping me with that? Okay, we prepare. Okay, check. <clears throat> we can also share your your presentation later on to everybody, if you don't mind. Yeah, mostly it is an illustration. Uh, so I, I just, you know, playing with pictures. So this in uh, in setting of the fact that we have also some working on the ground in Indonesia. So it is better to share. I hate this. Uh, sorry. Bentar ya. <laughs> Oh. Huh? I heard a bird around you. Ah, uh, yeah. Very nice this. I don't know. Uh, is someone from from your side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bisa? Bisa. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. 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 Okay, Young generation is no problem. To us, it is a problem. <laughs> Usually, it's okay. Next, um, okay, um, to slide four, please. Slide four, 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 Okay, and uh, before of that, before four, four, slide four. Um, okay, I can start from here. Okay, next, please. Um, yeah, that's, this is what have been said already uh, this morning by our college presentation by Professor Jewel and also Professor Mary about the conventional approach is not sufficient. And so more innovative approach is needed, including by, you know, 
uh, involving religious and religious but uh, uh, umma to to participate in the uh, environmental movement and religious leader is using their language that easily understood through story symbol and can be understood by people in within the religion of course and also part of the important things if we talking about uh, the uh, environmental action is their changing of attitude and behavior change toward the nature and the environment so the other things religion have networks all the religious re leaders are uh, usually connects each others so they have their institution organizations and their their own um, uh, related uh, action that can inspire other people and or uh, uh, other of their followers to to take action for the nature and the, and the environment and the other things uh, why religions uh, because of the religious institution are the most sustainable institution you can see that there are 5000 years ago religious established not it's it is just far beyond uh, the you know ngos that campaigning there's only at the 20 20th century 19th centuries uh, they're talking about the uh, environment and the creation next um I, I was asking about green Islam in Indonesia. Um, this is, I think, quite overestimate. Um, what what kind of green Islam in Indonesia, especially? What is the indicator? I would like to uh, to say, sharing a specific thing of the measure of why how green uh, Islam Islamic movement uh, in Indonesia and. Um, by relating to to the religious and uh, environmental action, um, I am using this uh, smart indicator to measure how religious, uh, how Islam particularly um, being implemented in, in in embedding with the environmental movement specific measurable attainable re relevant and time bound and in 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 term of specific measurable i would like to to share about the how green uh, institutions uh, are mentioned being taught uh, at least uh, over the 2000s and last time bomb of 20 years and how how green the participation of the imam the wakaf the suku is in Indonesia, so we can learn. Uh, we can learn as so there exists and uh, green participate participation uh, for Muslim communities in Indonesia. Uh, attainable, attainable can be um, you know can be facts or whether it's from teaching, from preaching books, from modules that exist. How uh, is that any? And also the time bond. Time bond can be yeah last 20 years uh, starting 2000 perhaps uh, because of the influence of the Harvard book Islam and ecology has, can be also uh, mentioned here. Next, uh, this is to my uh, knowledge. Correct me if, if I'm wrong on the basic discipline that can be an indicator how we can measure the Islamic ethic in theology and also the implementation of it, uh, how they are using the Quran, the Sunnah and Fiqh, uh, jurisprudence, because Fiqh are uh, written by the author, uh, by the authoritative um, Imam or the Pukaha, it can be very seldom to find Fiqh but you can find also isma ulama uh, isma ulama and also the fatwas uh, uh, regarding islamic ethic and environment next so this is one of the important uh, 
institution in Indonesia, if we look at Indonesia as a whole, Islam in Indonesia accordingly represented by two big organizations. However, there are many small, small organizations uh, regarding um, their activities to engage the Ummah, their follower. This one is Nahdlatul Ulama. Nahdlatul Ulama is uh, about one, one, like one million, uh, 150 million followers. And Muhammadiyah is over eight, 80 million followers. Uh, in the, this is uh, the institution or organization of the Islamic organization within Indonesia. Also, they have a branch uh, abroad sometime. They have abroad in, in uh, such as in America or many countries. And they have some program related to environment. So this is an indicator that they are you know, going green. For example, the Pengurus Besar Nahdlatul Ulama established National Movement for Forest and Environment in 2007. Uh, the from Nahdlatul Ulama Odi. And, and also the they established disaster management environment department and uh, and, and responding to climate change now and they are still uh, include uh, climate change issues uh, um, rehabilitation knowledge management and not networking on on a green issue within their department and bringing their uh, follower in 2005, Muhammadiyah established uh, Environmental Council uh, of Muhammadiyah in uh, in order to engage their followers to harness uh, nature and environmental activities. Next, so this is an institution we in early, uh, have a look and is there are um, uh, fatwas? Fatwas, they are instead of fatwas within the organization, this is a fatwa from Majlis Ulama. The fatwas we have uh, like seven um, fatwas related to environment, but the, the oldest fatwa is 1983 regarding population health and development, which is related to the you know family planning at that time, but it's, it is before 2000, of course, but uh, beyond 2000, uh, we have uh, six patwas related to um, to environment. So this is uh, a way of greening uh, of your follower by you know you by using you can say by by, uh, by sharing religious teaching such as this patwa. So one of the best patwa i i'm also uh, in pop uh, is the two patwa here this is the protection of wildlife for the balance of the ecosystem in 2014 and also uh, the patwa in 2016 the law of burning and land and forest so since 2016 president jokowi also established uh, badan restorasi gambut and together with the Badan Restorasi Gambut, the, the Pitland Agency, we working together with the ulama, you know, to train the many clerics, you know, to understand about the issue of burning and pro prohibited from burning, you know, creating khutbah and everything to to help the the planet uh, uh, not being destroyed by the burning. So that's why. 2017, 2019 is is the the burning is decrease. I think uh, I don't, it is it is as a, a result. I believe of the together that we um, uh, we can uh, implement this this kind of approach. Next, so this is one news you can we can share later on the uh, yeah, the news uh, covered by bbc about the muslim cleric preaching indonesian peatland 
because 80% of our emission in Indonesia coming from peatland. Sometimes, you know, like yearly coming from Sumatra, you know, the haze across to Malaysia. So that Thank was not happen. That was not happen last three years at least yeah. uh, since that uh, sended fatwa release. Well, I hope it is a positive sound. Next problem, yang sekarang ni Kalimantan. Yeah, this is the resource that we uh, we uh, produce with together with Majlis Ulama Indonesia. Our center of uh, Universitas Nasional is working with the uh, Majlis Ulama and also uh, other NGOs. We train the Imam using this module. Next. And we, we also involving the Islamic boarding school, as we said, uh, we can we can have the future generation from the Islamic boarding school. We have like 27,000 Islamic boarding school totally around uh, and, and the countries with 4 million students. Uh, this is potential to import them because they are leaders in the future as well the leaders of the madrasa the 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 manager the director of madrasa they are also leaders in the community next so greening the pesantren uh, we we can say that is a, a campus model that um um, using the natural material, material renewable material, like using bamboo and also the model of the school that uh, is called Eco Pesantren. Next. Ah, okay, fine. Please. Yeah, this Eco Pesantren established uh, also in, in, in Bandung, uh, you know, uh, in popping the communities, you know, planting, the organic farming for the healthy food and they distributed to uh, to the market. So this is quite independent Santan involving uh, about hundred a, a thousand individual uh, with 14 hectare agricultural land with 300 students. Next, this is on the aspect of um, uh, agriculture sustainable agriculture and this is also uh, the pesantren is screening their energy system you know, by using the solar panel next this is just an illustration from thousand of pesantren this is nurul haramain by pioneering uh, planting harn about millions trees you know uh, from the graded land from that that land, their campus now is within that the these trees, you know, because of their the planting of the trees, all the communities are following. And this is the Ustad that we trained 2003. And uh, together with him, uh, we create what we call document uh, Menggagas Fiki Lingkungan to create uh, Islamic fiqh uh, on uh, on environment. Next is K Hasan Nain Joani in Entebbe. Uh, we have also a, a green green masjid movement, which is now uh, you can see that uh, ecomasjid.org.id um, implementing the eco masjid movement. We have like eight hundred thousand masjid in in the countries. So this is hard thing to do. Um, we starting from small, and we starting from some model. Uh, with Eco Masjid, you can visit that Eco Masjid, uh, Eco Masjid the website later on. You can share that Eco Masjid by googling it. Next, and uh, we have uh, we working also together with Jakat Islamic Charity. You know, to work, working together is that Jakat in fact Sadaka and Wakaf. Um, is potential to generate uh, a movement. So by by working together with with this, uh, you know, hand in hand, like uh, Dompet Duapa, they earn like 27 million uh, last 2019 
and they are also have program on how to uh, to enhance the economy of people uh, in in the peripheral or and on, on the vicinity of national park uh, by using um, sustainable economy by planting uh, trees uh, by uh, sustainable agriculture or supporting uh, them uh, by harvesting bees uh, from the honey for the for the wild honeys and and providing the the market system so this is a positive for us so many things to do in indonesia with our natural forest as well in in, in order to protect natural forest in and uh, to hold their hand to cut the trees we have to shift their their uh, transformative uh, economy to the sustainable way next next please so this one uh, a model as well in aceh hutan wakaf before the hutan wakaf can you go up yeah, hutan wakaf this is the uh, hutan wakaf uh, in aceh they started because this is by, by youth young people uh, communities in aceh they starting to buy land by hutan wakaf uh, buy and let that land growing and they planting trees there sometimes if if you have a planting uh, scheme we don't we don't know uh, how to plan and where you have to plant so by buy the land and you plant that trees here and you using a wakaf your 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 tree will be uh, will be forever so this is the guarantee of the wakaf uh, by by that you can also feed uh, not only yourself you know by generating the ecosystem services but also you can feed bees you can feed the, the tigers uh, you, you know the ecosystem established and 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 all the living things are uh, in in this waka forest they are secure next next please uh, Yes, uh, this is the training that we conduct. Uh, of course, the Muhammadiyah and Hadatul Ulama is also conducted the similar training. And this is the training uh, conducted by Center for Islamic Studies with the Majlis Ulama Indonesia regarding to, to uh, we, we that two patwas. One uh, regarding the patwas on the wildlife protection and the second is regarding the, the the yellow, the the green one is about um, protecting uh, or burning of the peatland and and forest. So the cleric are enthusiastic, of course, with the training, and they and they, they believe this is an effective to understand about environment. Environment is something new with them to about the connect you know, between science and environment and Islam. Is, is 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 new thing for them to understand that there are connection between the text and the context. Uh, this is the important thing to engage with the clerics and also the ulama together. We sit together and we implement together the implementation, and then we create uh, things like khutbah like this, the uh, and also the module, uh, the khutbah spread it uh, all over Indonesia. And also the module how to do it, and this is spreaded for the for the clerics uh, all over Indonesia. Next, yeah, this is in Riau, in Pitland Eco Patwa Training um, in Jambi, South Sumatra, working together with the Pitland Agency. We train about two hundred. 44 clerics, and we're still continuing to, to engage with them with another program. Next, the, the next, please. Next. Uh, this is uh, in Riau, in Riau, in Rimbang Baling. We also, this is, these clerics are from 
the pilates masjids so we we pull them from their pilates we train them you know putting them in a place and communicating with them how to disseminate the khutbah and the new thing about the environment uh, and, and 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 also the conservation aspect of wildlife uh, because these people are coming from uh, protected areas in the Bangbalin, in Riau. They are very important as grassroots and very uh, important to engage with the communities. Next, please. And this is also in Riau. Next. I think quite similar. The other thing in Riau also. Next. Next, please. This is in Ujung Kulon, and Ujung Kulon in Java. We train hundreds of imam as well. And this one is interesting. A green sukuk. I think Malaysia also also uh, releasing green sukuk in 2017 or 2016. And Indonesia uh, implement green sukuk in 2018. Uh, sukuk is wow. Islamic bond. So we using sukuk for uh, investing and leveraging the uh, finance for sustainable development goals, uh, including the biodiversity and also for the renewable energies and also the including the um, sustainable agriculture and green building. So, Indonesian government released the sukuk, and this supposed to be only for the green investment. Uh, of course, should be implied Sharia Sharia imply for the green sukuk, and this is interesting to mobilize and to mainstreaming the Islamic uh, Islamic teaching for helping the environment. I think that's all my presentation. Next, we can have terima kasih. Thank you for the opportunity to be together with you all. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I think most of participants surprised how you work in Indonesia on practical way. Okay, uh, <coughs> basically. Uh, Professor, still left. Just left for oh. another session. Eh? Okay. okay. Uh, now the second round. Basically, we go for the question. We have a few questions from the uh, participant also. Uh, okay. Okay. First one basically is uh, we're talking about eco spiritually or spirit uh, spiritual ecology or ecotology. How this uh, ecotology can help? Uh, <clears throat> what we call this question is basically how how this ecotology help people to understanding uh, connection with the earth and how we uh, repair all the damage been done. First round I give to Prof uh, Tucker. <laughs> So I think that's a wonderful question, and I'm noting many in the chat that are very, very good, very thoughtful. Um, you know, ecotheology is new. That's what I was trying to suggest in my little talk, is that this field is not more than 25 years old in terms of beginning to draw all the religions into a conversation of how can they develop their ecotheology, Islamic, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, et cetera. Um, and what Rudy just did was to show us how robust that is now, how it's flourishing in Indonesia and the Islamic ethic and fatwa and the Prasantran's teaching uh, about a, an eco-theological is Islam. So I think we need to move this forward. Uh, we need to move it forward with great rapidity and urgency and so on. But I think the, the idea here is that many of the religions, especially the so-called Western religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, have had a strong ethics for human-human relations. This goes back again to the rector's presentation. 
but human human uh, relations and human divine uh human god human allah uh relations but human earth relations have been left out by and large and that's this new period of drawing in the extraordinary um, resources of the Quran to create a new Islamic eco-theology. And this can be done. Rudy just demonstrated how it is being done and in a very exciting way um, in education, but also on the ground. Uh, and that's, um, I, I'm very inspired by that as I've been by Rudy for a long time. <laughs> Practical, is a practical way. Okay, uh, on how about Dr. Fakhruddin? Any response to the question? Yes, uh, quite similar with uh, Professor Mary Evelyn Tucker. Um, I agree with her that theology and account theology things is a new things. And I've been in the discussion with the ulama regarding this. Uh, um, on the teaching of, you know, uh, what do we call, why we are not exploring the, like the Fikhul Bi'an, Fikhul Bi'an, Islamic jurisprudence on environment. And all the ulama was coming together, discussed, and they said that we don't find any, you know, specific things about uh, region environment, but you can, you, can, you can find out the Islamic teaching from the uh, from all the core system uh, or the peripheral system of the teaching of Islam um, in, in many peak, for, for example, uh, any peaks, they are coming, you know, starting with the teaching of, uh, with the Tahara. Tahara is um, um, uh, how, how to clean your, uh, your body, the ablution and everything. And that's related to to the environment, of course, and all on that can be merged in the Islamic teaching as a whole. So, uh, by uh, you know training the Imam, we are engaging uh, just you know re like reminding that they what they have in in hand already. So. You know, we quoting the Qur Quranic ayahs as, as Mizan, um, Khalifa, and Fitra. You know, back to Fitra, and about the uh, don extravagance, and because this earth is limited, all the teaching are there. So we just only translate it to contextualize that what is inspiring from the text. So that's to me, it is very important to have uh, eco-theology in, in order to find out the why, how we, like as the rector said that the position of us in, uh, in the creation of this nature, the position of human, we should understand who are we in this planet. So that is the material we give. Okay, thank you. Okay, basically, I just uh, read one of a uh, uh, Prof. Tucker article mentioned about uh, consumer uh, culture. Okay, basically, nowadays, the uh, young generation they go for TikTok, uh, all this. Uh, you measure success based on what brand, what type of uh, handphone you use, or what type of car. So, basically, is another one is a uh, hedonistic lifestyle. So how uh, your response? Well, that's a great question. And I think that's really at the heart of the matter. You know, eco-theology is going to move forward and eco-ethics are moving forward. But one of the blocks is exactly this kind of consumerism as the meaning of life. And that's this false dream of material goods are gonna bring happiness. And as I mentioned, the American dream is, is about that and it's a false dream. And that's why Thomas Berry said, we need a dream of the earth. We need a dream of the sacred quality 
of universe and earth. That's what's going to revive the human spirit in a much deeper way. Now, I'm not saying this is simple. You know, America is just over the top in consumerism. I've grown up my whole life with it. I, I'm so uninterested in it. But Wall Street and Madison Avenue advertising and Hollywood all feeds into it. But it's a culture that needs to change. And I think the next generation here in the US, the next generation doesn't care about big cars or big houses in the same way. So I think it is changing. It's going to take a long, long time. Um, and other, even the fashion industry in this pandemic, you know, is changing. So the pandemic's going to change a lot of what are real values and what is, what's true health, what's true well-being for people, communities, and the planet. It's a very good question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I refer to Dr. Fakhuri Makujaya. Uh, I just want to quote from uh, late Warangi Matai on the local wisdom. If Africans want to be successful, they must go back to their roots and their culture. So what the Dr. Fakhruddin Jaya did in Indonesia basically is a local wisdom. So can you elaborate more on the local wisdom? For example, in Indonesia, we have a Tanah Adat. How can you use this local wisdom to protect a nature? Please, Dr. Fakhruddin. Yes, thank you. Um, Islam doesn't separate, even appreciate the, the wisdom uh, that we, um, however, Islam is spread out of all the world. And they are, they are uh, respected, the Adat. We, we, we know in the Aidah Usul Fik, we have um, like Al Auruf Wal Adat. So I, I find many interesting in the field when I'm coming to the to the local and uh, to the village. There are so many wisdom in protecting the nature and the sustainable use of um, of uh, environment and, and natural things. One of the thing is hutan adat and the about the uh, lubuk lubuk larangan. Lubuk larangan we we found uh, spread that in Sumatra, like in Riau, Jambi, in North Sumatra, they are protected the animal, like prohibit uh, in, in certain zone areas, in, in in Islam we call it harim zone, and they they close that areas uh, within one years before it's allowable to harvest, and they are using. Uh, the local adat system and agreement, and they announced that in the masjid. So this related with with Islamic teaching. They announced that the closing of the uh, lubuk larangan for the fish, virtually, um, for certain you know years, and they open it uh, usually before uh, before Hari Raya or before Adar Fitri or Ramadan. And they make an auction for that fish, and that from that auction, they uh, they gen generate funding. They generate funding. The, the funding is for the masjid, for the orphan, and for the communities. So this is a good thing in Sumatra. We found that something adat related. I'm not very deep on the hutan adat, but uh, I've been in a discussion of the, you know, this kind of approach with the IUCN related to the hutan adat and uh, with the appreciation of how to we connect the sacred sites of the, of the hutan adat with the masyarakat adat together in the Muslim world. We've been uh, a gathering in Malta in 2017, and we are recognizing about this kind of uh, system that can contribute to the natural area. So it is challenge to, to explore. Uh, of course, we are working with the Muslim communities. It's very interesting. Also, many of them in Minang area, in uh, Orang Minang, which is particularly, particularly Islam, they are 
you know like merging within adat agama uh, adat bersandi sara sara bersandi kitabullah so we we'll, we're working with uh, adat people as well thank you uh, <coughs> uh, okay uh, on request we are going to open the floor to everybody to any question for both uh, anybody want to ask question Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Prof. Hoi, if you have any question, Jalili online. Eh? Okay, please. Hello. Yeah, hello. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation. I uh, mean, that was a very beautiful presentation. And I uh, thank you, Director, for teasing out uh, the nuances of the Islamic perspective to this conversation. So my question is this, uh, the outlook of education generally seems to be market driven. And uh, particularly when you look in the Western world, we educate for the market. And uh, when you look at the nature of the market, it's little about uh, being environmentally sensitive. It's about uh, going out there, you want to be on the technological meal of you know, innovating something, you're always producing something. And that has been driving the environment crazy. So my question to Mary is this, and also to the rector, what needs to change in the current Mary. outlook of education to create the next generation of people who will be eco theologically educated and sensitive mm. to the needs of a sustainable society? Well, it's a wonderful question. <laughs> it's really central to this whole discussion. So thank you. Um, you know, the economic drive, and you're right to point to the West and uh, to a capitalist system that without limits and a system that says economic progress is the measure of everything, not the health of people or planet, this is a false sensibility. And the externalities in economics to say it doesn't matter about what happens to the environment. It's just profit for the corporations. You know, a lot of this is changing. I'm sure a number of you can give examples from your own countries or universities or work. Um, there's a movement here in the US away from shareholder uh, that the bottom line is only the shareholders, that the stakeholders in corporations are what's important, which is much more inclusive, including the environment. There's corporate social responsibility for many, many years that's trying to move corporations into this space. Rudy referred to the finance, the green banks, and so on, um, that's moving in this direction. Bill McKibben has worked on divestment, and it's a $14 trillion um, industry now, divesting from oil and gas and so on. Religious institutions are at least a quarter of that number, and they have led the way. So I think the pressure of the moral force um, towards corporations as devouring the earth um, is definitely moving forward. And young people here in the US do not want to go into work for corporations that do not have social responsibility, and they are calling them to accountability on that. So it's not just greenwashing. So I could go on you know, for some time about this. It's hugely important. Uh, we have a long way to go around the world, um, but there is, I think, many signs, quite astonishing, um, especially in the divest, invest movement, towards sustainability, towards sustainable energy, and so on. This is one of the, uh, I think, markers of this movement toward uh, a new economics. I could say much more, but I'll stop. Thank you, Dr. Dutka. Um, on behalf of our Rector IAM, I'm very sorry because our Rector I engaged another uh, issue at the, at the moment. So I find uh, one question very, very quite interesting. Uh, you know, it's about pig and a dog. Basically, the question is about pig. In Malaysia, pig and dog is very no. Okay, uh, since the question is from Indonesia, uh, maybe Dr. Fakri want to respond. Eh? The question is, uh, Abu, I'm Abu Abbas Sofian from Kediri, East Java, Indonesia, living in slope of volcanic mountain of Kelud, which uh, 
a group of uh, Christian, Hindu, and other traditional group. But the Christian uh, protecting the pig. But according to the Muslim, it's forbidden. So how to justify the program? Uh, harmonize. Living harmonize. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, it's, it's a matter of how to harmonize people. They, I, I believe in the community, like they in Kelut, they already harmonize themselves already. I have this kind of experience. When I'm coming to Papua uh, in, in Ramadan time, and I was coming over there as a preacher, as Ustad, they uh, expect me to come. And this is in the remote area where is Christian and, and Muslim are uh, you know, living together. And, and at that time, my, this history was, um, they are using the Christian dog to hunting, <laughs> because it's in a remote area, to hunting for, uh, for the Ustad who coming. <laughs> Me, you know, of course, they, they, they halal food, but they, they still, you know, I'm, I'm using my dog, you know, Christian dog, and, and, and they, they for hunting. And uh, this was in Irmotare. This is true. I believe Indonesia have their sure. own harmony uh, sure. in that, and they have uh, in case of pig, uh, <laughs> also Muslim not allowed to eat a pig, but it, if something happen, uh, the dog of Muslim, you know, hunting a pig, for example, they are not giving the, the pig for their family, for Muslim family, they give it to Christian. I believe uh, that kind of harmonies is also something, something uh, good in the in the grassroots. There's no problem at all with the, with that uh, kind of uh, living harmonies within that religion. Thank you, Rutter. Uh, normally, we some some group of people using religious to break up the society. Maybe we can use uh, religious uh, environment issue to grouping back our society. So uh, <laughs> any last question from the floor? Anybody want to ask a question before we wrap up our session? If I have one question. Um, please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm, prof, I'm Prof Jalal from Faculty of Science. I'm usually, I'm Department of Marine Science. My question to uh, Mary, Mary Evelyn, uh, just want to know that during, after this COVID, uh, what do you think this, inter, this environment effects of this religion and environment in the tropic and temperate countries? What do you think, uh, I mean, in US, um, I mean, focus on this matter because of this COVID to Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, an excellent question. I wish I could answer it well. It's, it's um, probably beyond any of us to really know, but thank you. It's really, really important. You know, right now I'm on a, um, a working group from the Vatican actually on this question. What is a post-COVID world going to look like? And um, this uh, group has been meeting each week uh, from all around the world, and the Pope is just about to um, he's begun to issue statements on this, a new catechism, a new sense of liturgy and all of this in a post-COVID world. So I think we will, just to say what is obvious, but we are all profoundly changed by this experience, no question, whether we're young or old, vulnerable or, or not, um, we are deeply, deeply changed. But I think my biggest hope you know, going back to the question on the, the um, economics and the environment, I think we need deeply a new economics that is going to be more inclusive, more fair, more just with jobs and education and opportunities across the board. That's true in the US, there's no question. The inequities are horrific, they're not acceptable, uh, and people know that. So we need a new economics but the, the compliment is this, um, we don't need, and I, I say this with empathy for people who are more fundamentalists in their religious belief, and that includes Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, as we know. We have 
rather fundamentalist evangelicals in the US who have very conservative points of view that are simply not going to be helpful going forward. So that's why this religion and ecology and young evangelicals are getting why this is important as well. So across the board, we need to open up this space that isn't locked into just tradition is perfect in this way. No, it's got to be vibrant. It's got to be open to the modern world. And so many of you are saying in the chat box how education has to change because of Rudy's presentation. I couldn't agree more. And that is true for all the world's religions. That's my deepest hope that the economics will change and the education will change. And therefore a more robust environmental ethics will come forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful chance to be in dialogue with all of you. I've really enjoyed it so much. I hope we can do it again sometime. Inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. It'll be the honor for you. Okay, uh, we're going to go end our session. Uh, maybe Dr. Fakhruddin, we're going to wrap up uh, your this uh, morning session. Then after, after that, we, uh, the, for Dr. Mary, Mary Tucker, we'll wrap up the uh, presentation. Please, Dr. Fakhruddin. Yes, thank you. Um, the the way is long, the long long way to go. However, this COVID nineteen is uh, uh, gonna be a reflection for us together. All the continents uh, have to reflect uh, about our relation with the earth, with the nature, either not only. Uh, our live people like us, academic, uh, religious leaders, they have to close the school, they have to close the masjid, they have to close the synagogue, they have clo to close the Kaaba and make it more and more limited. So this like uh, the growth, what, what the economics says. So by, the, by rethinking of our relation with the nature, we need to find out what will be the future will be the uh, uh, the next generation if we have uh, you know business as usual lifestyle so i would like to to mention about three things in islamic aspect in in this particular islamic movement we have we call uh, three things one is jihad Jihad is, um, you know, everything related with the environment, how to protect the nature, restorate, restorating the nature uh, is a, a jihad. The secondly, the istihad. Istihad is the things that, you know, we have an innovation, you know, renewable energy, making better for nature, make, making better education, educating uh, the, the people, educating our kids or it's the hard new things that exploring about the nature. And the other thing is Zuhud. So G G I Z. Zuhud. Zuhud is Islamic teaching. What is our lifestyle now is regarding exploring the nature, our relation with the nature because of consumerism. And Zuhud is teaching us how we are sufficient, uh, uh, you know, um, we, with, within a limited material world. So material world is important, but we should get only what sufficient and, and we have to have look, you know, don't extravagance. La, la tabzir tidak berlebih-lebihan, tabzir boros and, 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 and other things. So that is why uh, Islam is teaching us about jihad, istihad, and zuhud. It's quoting uh, Doctor Aude, uh, Aude of, Palis uh, of the Jordanian, uh, Jordanian scientist. Aude. Aude. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Rudy. It's so wonderful to be in touch with you in this conversation. And please give my thanks to the rector, too, and, and to you as moderator. You've done a wonderful job. Um, I would just say um, very briefly, 
we are going to be doing massive open online classes in religion and ecology mm -hmm. through course Yale and Coursera. And I want especially to include, of course, we'll do all the world's religions, but I want to include examples from the Islamic world so that people can get access because Coursera has free courses and so on. So that's one thing we hope to open this up. And the website that I've mentioned is something I hope can be useful to all of you. Um, but let me just say three things. I like to say to our students at Yale that we give an intergenerational handshake to the mm. next generation, to future generations of what is, is going to be possible for them. We don't have all the answers, so we must be humble, the older generation, and yet empowering for the next generation. So that's the first thing, an intergenerational handshake. And secondly, absolutely essential is an intercultural, interreligious handshake. Um, that's why this has been so stimulating and marvelous for, for me, and I hope for you as well. Islam is so rich, so ancient, so filled with incredible um, wisdom and compassion that can be brought forward in our world. So this intercultural, interreligious uh, affirmation is what we need, I think, next, and openness um, and, in this handshake. And finally, the handshake that we as humans need to have, and we have it so naturally, honestly, is human nature handshake. I mean, nature is the, one of the great ultimate sources of inspiration. You know, sunrise and sunset, I'm mesmerized all the time by these things. Those like Rudy who get to be in for us and preserve for us, how extraordinary is that? What a gift. So this human earth relations, this, this handshake of mutually enhancing human earth relations is I think what this is about. And we as humans, <laughs> religious or not, have this very instinctually of the beauty and the wonder and the awe that nature inspires in us. So again, I thank you. I look forward to keeping in touch and may your work, all of you, may it go forward and flourish for all future generations. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, Dr. Takra and Dr. Fakhruddin. <clears throat> I just uh, ending our session with basically if you're talking about zuhud basically the modern word is minimization and uh, yeah, there was a hadith if a day of a uh, uh, day of judgment if you have a seed in your hand just plant it okay so if you watch the presentation how excellent work done by dr Tucker and dr fakhruddin don't be demotivated because they only judge you the cut the Allah judge what is your efforts, not the result. So mm. just do whatever you can do at the moment and the hoping is the best. So that, that uh, and that I just thank you very much for the session and opportunity uh, by AEM for the moderate session. And let thank hang over this session to Prof. Farida. Thank you very much. All right, then on behalf of the university, I wish to thank everybody, especially Dr. Tucker, who just come up from Hurricane. <laughs> Wonderful. And Dr. Fakhruddin getting up so early. It's been fun. I think gathering from, uh, uh, you know, from what I gathered from the responses, everybody's inspired, you know, and we hope to do this again. Thank you, Mary. We hope to welcome yeah. you again next session. Thank you so much. Thank thank you. Bye. Bye. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> Bye-bye, Mary. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so stay, much. stay safe, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Many blessings on uh, all of you. You too. Yeah, no photo group. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can. yes. Photo group. Yes. Photo group. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Can. Whoever is in need, the photo group, uh, everyone <laughs> open their page. Okay. Uh, without, uh, without the boys, please. So we. Okay. Everybody put on your yeah. video. Uh, everybody on. Smile. Smile. One. Two. Three. Two. Three. Left. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Heilsgeber. Ja, it's wonderful. 